Hello, my name is Scarlett Lewis, and I'm here to tell you a story of extraordinary courage and hope about a little boy who left a message powerful enough to change the world. And at the end of my talk, I'm going to give you the meaning of life. And I ran that last part by my uh, 13-year-old son, and he gave me the thumbs up. <laughs> So I'm here standing before you because of the events that occurred on December 14th, 2012, when an angry young man shot his way through the glass doors of Sandy Hook Elementary and proceeded to mercilessly gun down 20 first graders and six teachers and administrators. When the gunman entered my son's room, he continued his killing spree, murdering my son's beloved teacher who was standing right beside him when his gun ran out of bullets. And it was during the short delay that my six-year-old son called to his friends who were standing on the other side of the room and said, run. And he was able to save nine lives before the gunman reloaded and killed everyone remaining in the room, including my six-year-old son, Jesse McCord Lewis. People asked me if I was surprised by Jesse's bravery, and I really wasn't because I feel like Jesse was born brave. Jesse was 11 pounds when he was born. And I remember going to the nursery, and all the nurses were gathered around the window taking pictures. And I walked up and I said, what are you taking pictures of? And they said, there's this enormous baby that's crawled <laughs> almost out of his bassinet. And that was Jesse. Jesse was full of light and love, and he kept this kind of larger-than-life persona his entire life. Jesse would enter a room and he would say, here's Jesse. His favorite toys were little yellow ducks and little army men, which was a perfect example of the two parts of his personality. This warm, little, fuzzy, cuddly six-year-old boy and this rough and tumble cowboy. One of my most poignant memories of Jesse was when he came home from school. He would kick off his school shoes and he'd lean down and put on these snow boots with camo around the edge, regardless of season. And he would strap on this army helmet that one of my friends gave him that he frequently wore to bed. And he would go out and do what we called patrolling. And he would patrol on our farm. So I thought to myself, how could something like this have happened? And I realized that it was an angry thought in the shooter's head at some point that caused the entire tragedy. And I pictured the shooter as a young boy having angry thoughts without the nurturing environment and tools to deal with them. And so anger feels bad. So he did what sometimes we do, which is blame someone to try to find relief. Now, I'm not sure who he blamed, his mother, his father, his teachers, but the minute he did that, he blamed someone, he gave away all of his personal power to change his situation and his feelings, and he became a victim. Prolonged victimization leads to rage, and rage is what fills our prison systems and leads to acts of violence such as Sandy Hook. And the most amazing thing is, a thought can be changed. December 14, 2012, was one of the worst mass shootings in U.S. history. However, I say it was the world's greatest day of compassion because on that day, the world came together as one in the true meaning of compassion because compassion is love in action and love is a verb. And everyone on that day sent prayers and did random acts of kindness, and it continues to this day, sent sympathy letters that I call love letters because they're just so full of wonderful feeling. You see, because compassion has two components. The first component to compassion is identifying with someone's pain. But the second component to compassion is sometimes overlooked because identifying with someone's pain is painful. But the second part of compassion is when you actually do something to help ease another's pain. And that's the most amazing thing about that component of compassion is that you get so much more back than you give out. 
So after the shooting, it was hard for me to go back to the farmhouse where I'd raised my two sons as a single mother. Jesse's light filled the entire house. So I went to my mom's house. But I did have to go back within a first couple of days to get Jesse's clothes for his funeral, something no parent should ever have to do. And it was on my way out that day that I noticed a message that Jesse had written on our kitchen chalkboard sometime shortly before he died. And that message said, nurturing, healing, love. Now, those three words are not in the vernacular of a six-year-old. And they were um, phonetically spelled because, of course, Jesse was uh, just in first grade and learning to write. But those three words are in the definition of compassion across all cultures. And the meaning was clear to me when I saw them. It was a spiritual knowing that Jesse didn't have a lot of time left on earth. And he wanted to leave a message of comfort for his family and friends. But he also wanted to leave a message of inspiration for the world. Because that's where we need to move towards. Nurturing, healing, love in order to survive and to thrive. JT is Jesse's older brother. He was 12 at the time, and he was with me on this trip home. And he came up to me on our way out, and he said, Mom, you know how we've been getting these incredible messages from Jesse? And we had. We've been getting blinking lights and dreams and precognitive drawings, which I now know is a whole field of study where kids draw how they're going to die, such as this one on the screen, which we call the angel and the bad man. This picture came home in Jesse's personal belongings in a box shortly after he died, stacked chronologically from his desk. And this is exactly how he died, facing the shooter. And I said, yes, did you get a message? And he said, I did. I just found this on my desk. He reached into his pocket, pulled out his wallet, opened up a little piece of paper, and on the paper it said, have a lot of fun. Now this message was prophetic for JT, because whereas Jesse was laughing and loud all the time, sometimes JT needs to be conjoled for a smile. But I thought it was really important for the whole world too, because isn't it important to have a lot of fun? It's become my mantra lately. At Jesse's funeral, I got up and I spoke. And I said, this whole tragedy started with an angry thought in the shooter's head, and an angry thought can be changed. So I asked everyone that day to please consciously change one angry thought into a loving thought every day. And I said, by doing that, you'll make yourself more peaceful, you'll positively impact those around you, and through the ripple effect, you'll make this a better world. And the feedback that I got from that was amazing because when people started to think about what they thought about and they realized that a lot of their thoughts were angry, this one simple conscious act changed their life. In fact, there was a doctor that attended the funeral and he's from the Midwest and he wrote and said, I never realized I spent my entire life angry and I never knew that I had a choice and making that one simple choice has changed my life. Christmas was two short weeks after the shooting. And as you can imagine, that was a very difficult day for me. I had already done my Christmas shopping, so all of Jesse's presents went to his myriad of little boy cousins that were running around that day. So I knew that JT and I had to get out of town. We needed to reconnect as the family of two that we were now. So within 24 hours, I had made plane reservations to a warm place, and we were on our way. That morning that we woke up, there was a huge snowstorm, and we took off for the airport, and this has never happened to me before, but the point of origin of our flight changed. So we got this pop-up and said, you need to go to a different airport. So we turned around and drove to a different airport, and then when we got there, our flight was canceled three times. And I'm telling you this for a reason, because no one could ever have anticipated when we landed. Once we got in the air, the airline gave us a movie to make up for the time delay. So everyone's quietly watching their movie, except for me. My movie is blinking furiously the whole flight and then changing down 20 channels to a radio stations, playing songs exactly for me. Jesse's Girl, uh, Missing You, Love You, Wish You Were Here. In fact, I whipped out my cell phone and opened up the notes and wrote down every word because I knew that they were for me. 
I look over at JT and I didn't want to say anything because you never want to put words into your teenager's mouth, but also I didn't want to make him sad. But he eventually looked over at me and he said, Jesse. And I said, I know. So we land. I never did get to see my movie, which is okay. And one of my girlfriends emailed me and said, how was the flight? And I said, it was incredible. Jesse's all over this flight. And she wrote me back and she said, sometimes spirits linger because they want to make sure you're going to be okay. And I knew what I had to do. I didn't say anything to JT because this was our healing fun trip. Got off the plane, asked him to watch the luggage, and I went to the bathroom and locked myself in a stall. And I said a prayer. And I said, Jesse, if you're lingering to see if we're going to be okay, JT and I are going to be fine. I want you to go be with Jesus. If you can be in both places at once, that would be fantastic. <laughs> but if you can't, please go be in the arms of Jesus. And I w- walked out of the stall, washed my face off, because it was truly one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And I went outside. I said, all right, JT, let's go. We went and we rented our car. We drove out of the airport driveway, made a right onto the highway there. And there written in the sky was Jesse and Jesus together forever. I pulled over. I looked at JT. JT looked at me and said, Jesse's with Jesus. And I said, I know. And we sat there for a long time. Jesse with a backwards J, in ca- how he wrote it, in case I was confused and thought it was a different Jesse. <laughs> so I took pictures. And after a while, JT said, can we go to Disney World now? <laughs> When we got home from that trip, we found that nothing had changed. Despite all of our miracles and all of our signs, we were still very angry and we were still very sad. But we were blessed because people from all over the world had descended on Newtown to help with our trauma. And there was a woman that had just come back from Rwanda working with orphan genocide survivors there. And for those of you who aren't familiar, there was a genocide in Rwanda in 1994 where over one million Tutsis were murdered by their Hutu neighbors within 100 days. And she suggested that we have a live Skype with some orphan genocide survivors who might possibly have been through something worse than us. So we sat around in front of this screen when two beautiful young adults came on the screen. And they said, JT, we've heard about what happened to your brother. And we're so, so sorry. We wanted to reach out to you to share our experience, to let you know that you're going to be okay and that you're going to feel joy. And this was so incredibly important to us at that point because we weren't sure. So the first person that shared her story was Chantel. Chantel had been eight years old when her neighbors had broken into her home and murdered her entire family in front of her by machete. Then they took her by her hair, slit her throat, cut her all over her body, and buried her in a shallow grave amongst the bodies of her family members, where she had to hide for several days before she climbed out and got her way into an orphanage. And she said it was when she was in the orphanage that she started to feel gratitude for the walls that gave her uh, support for the food that she was getting, the little amount of regular food, and for the human compassion that she was feeling. And she said it was that point that she realized that she had to forgive the people that murdered her family. Because if she didn't, she would be going down the same path of anger and destruction that they had gone down. And she said once she made the choice to forgive, she was able to step outside of her own pain and to be in service to others. And she said that's when the real healing began. And Matthew had a slightly different uh, situation. He and his family had escaped into the mountains. And they were eating grass for 100 days while watching their entire community be destroyed. And when they came home, his mother died of starvation. His father was so traumatized he couldn't take care of the family. And that all fell to Matthew. But Matthew loved school so much that even though they didn't have enough money for breakfast or lunch, he walked down a mountain for two hours and back up every single day just to go to school. No hope of ever being anything other than a subsistence farmer with no running water and no electricity. Well, after this experience, JT and I went to the living room, sitting in our respective chairs, and we started to realize we have a lot to be grateful for. We're surrounded by family and friends. We have loving neighbors bringing dinner to our door every day. We're, we're in the prayers of a whole world, and we have each other. And then we both consciously made the choice to forgive the man who murdered our precious Jesse. 
because we knew if we didn't make this decision that we might possibly be stuck in this pit of anger and despair for the rest of our lives. And then I looked over and JT was writing in a journal. And I said, what are you writing? And he said, those kids reached out to me in love and I'm going to reach back out to them and I'm going to start a fundraising campaign and I'm going to send them to college. And the next day he went to school by himself because at that point he hadn't. And I felt like I couldn't make him because I had sent one son to school and he didn't come home. He went to school by himself and started a fundraising campaign. And within two months, was able to Skype back to that same group and announce to a woman named Betty that he had raised enough money to send her to college. JT was able to see, with a little bit of effort on his behalf, how he changed someone's life. And I have actually seen JT heal himself through being in service to others. No medication, no doctors, simply service to others. So incredibly important. I've spoken about nurturing healing love, Jesse's message, all over the world through the media. I've spoken to schools. I've spoken to civic groups, churches. Uh, JT and I were actually in a prison less than two months ago speaking to inmates. And it was amazing to see the process of when they started to think about what they thought about and realize that anger had led them down a path of self-destruction and realize the fact that they had a choice. Because, of course, we don't always have a choice in what happens to us, but we always, always have a choice in how we react. And that means that we can always choose a loving thought over an angry thought. And when they made that decision, it was beautiful to watch them dedicate their lives to choosing love. In fact, one of the inmates said at the end of my talk, you've saved many lives today with your message. And I said, that's Jesse's message of nurturing, healing love. I want to talk just a little bit more about forgiveness because forgiveness is so important to, uh, to the process of healing. And I was giving a talk to at-risk youth and talking about forgiveness. And one of them raised their hand and said, what is that? And I said to myself, oh, I don't have a Webster definition of forgiveness. How could I stand in front of people and not really understand what it is? So I had to dig deep inside myself and figure out what it meant to me. And I said, you know what? I feel like I'm connected to the shooter with somewhat of a, an umbilical cord. And I see my personal power running to him through the form of anger. So I actually had to take visualize a big pair of scissors and snip that cord. And by doing that, I was in no way condoning what he had done. But I was separating myself from him, and I was able to move forward with all of my personal power intact by that act of forgiveness. And then he raised his hand and said, how long did it take you to do that? And I said, that's a great question, because it starts with a choice, but then it becomes a process. And sometimes we fall back into anger, and we feel like we failed, but we haven't. We just have to forgive again. I remember waking up on Jesse's birthday, June 30th, in a pit of anger and despair, because Jesse should have been with me to celebrate that day. And I had planned this huge party. It was uh, in celebration of all the first responders, and there were over a thousand people coming. Big top tent, three bands, and I woke up thinking, I can't even get out of bed. What have I done? This is ridiculous. I can't face anyone. And I knew what I had to do. I took a step back, I took a deep breath, and I made the choice to forgive again. And I was actually able to go to that party and celebrate my precious son's life and have moments of joy. And now, what we've all been waiting for, the meaning of life. The meaning of life is nurturing, healing, love. Nurturing is caring and kindness, healing is forgiveness, and love is compassion in action. Love in action, plus the bravery to choose to have a lot of fun. Thank you, Jesse.